Welcome to Modern Animism Radio. I'm your host, Laura Giles from Pan Society. Thank you all for being here. Two weeks ago, the United States relaxed the mask rules for most places, and we now have an honor policy that states if you're vaccinated, you can go without a mask. And if you're not, you continue to wear a mask. As a holistic therapist, uh, I experienced mass anxiety in my clientele after that. And I have to admit that I wasn't prepared either. During COVID, we got guidelines how to deal with the outbreak in our businesses and we're not given any this time. People just left, um, were left to themselves to figure it out. And it's been a couple of weeks and things have died down a bit, but today's show is about animism, COVID and vaccines. And I'll be joined uh, by Dwayne Hennessy. He's an animist from Oz and I hope we will help you to make sense of how animism, pandemics, and vaccines go together. So let's take a moment to give gratitude to the ancestors and elements. I acknowledge and thank the element of earth for all our wonderful fresh food that's beginning to ripen. I ask that you help us to stay grounded during this podcast so that we can help lead those who are still on shaky ground to stable ground. I acknowledge and thank the element of air for all the amazing things that we can't see like viruses. Uh, like <laughs> the inspiration that helps us to create new things, the breath that sustains our lives, imagination that makes things fun. And as Mercury's retrograde, I ask that you help us to communicate clearly and with inspiration. Thank you, Air. I acknowledge and thank the element of fire for the power to move us through things like this and to make things happen. I ask that you guide us through this podcast and the pandemic with a sense of personal and social responsibility. I acknowledge the element of water and thank you for help us, helping us to go deep, to go with the flow, to feel, to explore our intuitive side, to dig into the shadows and help us to renew. I acknowledge and thank our loving, helping ancestors from the human, plant, animal, and mineral kingdoms. I thank you for all the help that we receive that is seen and unseen. And thank you to all our listening community for being here today. I appreciate you, your support, your donations. If you'd like to help but can't donate, please consider reviewing us on iTunes or subscribing to our YouTube channel. That helps us to get better placement so that we're seen by more people. And thank you to everybody who's already done that. And if you have comments or questions, please send them to us. Our mission is to make animism accessible and your questions help us to know what's on your mind. So we wanna hear from you. And really that's why Dwayne and I are here today. Welcome Dwayne. Hey, how are you going? <laughs> Good, how are you? Oh, yeah, not too bad. Early morning here. Yeah. In the future, in the future. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and how are things in Oz with the pandemic? Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting because we've done quite well like New Zealand. So in terms, uh, in contrast to the rest of the world, we locked down pretty quickly and controlled this. Uh, we are in a seven-day lockdown in the state of Victoria at the moment because uh, we got the, what they call the Indian variant, into our city and it turns out one of the people who contracted that is also an uber eats driver <laughs> so it kind of spread around yeah. relatively quickly yeah. um i mean our main thing here i guess is that most australians are not interested in the vaccine that we have which is uh, i won't say the name just in case but the vaccine we got that the government's pushing we don't want we want one of the american ones and oh. uh yeah, but since we've had this sudden outbreak, like it's the fourth wave for Victoria, apparently, I only know three of them. Uh, I think yesterday about 100,000 people went and got vaccinated, and another 100,000 after that. But we've had cases of um, blood clots and stuff. So for me personally, I'm going to wait for the other vaccination to be available, the other vaccine. So, so you guys only have one option? Yeah, right. So we have we have three vaccines, but uh -huh. they're only giving us one option. And it's kind of interesting because I said it's probably because I spent a lot of money on it. But to be honest with you, <laughs> not being cynical, well, being cynical, the government blows enough money that really they could just throw that one away and just buy more of the other one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's kind of yeah. forced on us. And there's a lot of, I don't know if it's, I do watch ABC America, okay, so and NBC. So I see a lot of what's going on there and what Biden's mm -hmm. saying about the vaccines and so on. Um, but here we get a lot of uh, mixed messaging and information. They even said on TV, um, they had an interview and they literally said it blatantly to our face, they're going to run a fear campaign like they did with the AIDS pandemic. And I'm like, seriously, there's this much arrogance in the system now that you're telling us you're going to scare us. So I'm like, now I'm even less interested. 
Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> mm. It's an interesting scenario. Um, but unlike the rest of the world, we haven't had to wear masks a lot. Uh, we've been quite free up to this point since last year. So, yeah. Ah, so you're in a really different place than we are. Very. In fact, I'm in a different place to most of Victoria because we're outside the metropolitan area. So two months before COVID hit Australia or it became an issue that we knew about, I'd already moved regionally down into a place called Druin in Gippsland. So I'm like 80 k's away from where I work. Uh -huh. And uh, then they went into a lockdown that seemed like forever. But we were outside of what they call the Ring of Steel, which is around the Melbourne metropolitan area. So my wife and I are here, we've got tradies or tradespeople, you might call them, I don't know, but we call them tradies working on the back landscaping. There's all this stuff going on. We're kind of hunkered down. And then like four weeks later, we go out and someone says, what are you doing in your house? We can move around. I'm like, seriously? They're like, we're regional, mate. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I didn't even know. We were locked down for no reason. Oh, no. Wow. Oh, that, yeah, that's real different from here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've seen um, it's interesting because uh, there's, this, there's a lot of myth going around about, you know, well, it spreads more in winter and it's worse than summer. I'm like, well, it didn't happen in Florida. That looked pretty warm to me. And Brazil is like an average of 25 degrees centigrade, you know, so I'm like, it's spreading like wildfire. So the season is not affecting this thing. Mm -hmm. So I didn't buy into that. Um, yeah, and it's really a case of looking on the internet and finding information that you feel is accurate and is not a, a commercial interest or a government interest. So. I think that's the thing, yeah, because uh, there's a lot of information out there that some information is being suppressed. It's all very different. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I have two science degrees, and, and in that process, we had to learn how to read research papers. That was one of the best things that I got out of college, because yeah. you can really make statistics say anything. Yeah. So you really have to know how to interpret the data. And, you know, this, like you were saying, you know, if you got one vaccine and you want to sell this vaccine, then people want you to think that this is the vaccine. And they can skew yep. that in a way that's, uh, that makes the data say that. Absolutely. I mean, it goes back to the old, uh, I forgot what the film was called, with um, Russell Crowe in it. The, was it uh, not The Insider? The one about the cigarette companies. And basically, they skewed the data too, right? Like cigarettes weren't bad for your health up until they were. Right. So, so, right. Yeah. And our statistics on this seem to change a bit too. It's like, oh, well... Uh, for example, let's have a look at a vaccine, AstraZeneca, around the world. And they say, what's well, okay for people uh, over the age of 50? And then someone over the age of 50 has issues. Okay, so it's good for people over the age of 80. And you're like, they're just changing. I know what they're doing. They're looking at what's happening and saying, well, based on the limited stats we have now, we believe this until something else happens. So as they're learning as well, I'm sort of like, well, I'll wait till you learn a bit more perhaps before I make a decision on it. <laughs> Well, there's a couple of um, websites here, and I don't know if it includes just U.S. data or if it's everywhere, but um, I don't think they can, so it's not great data, but it's, it's data. So it's uh, the VAERS website, which is V-A-E-R-S.hhs.gov, is where you can find adverse reactions um, to vaccines of all sorts. So it's not just COVID, it's if, I don't know, rubella, if they have a vaccine for that or polio or any kind of thing. It's not the greatest because it relies on people reporting. Yep. So if you don't report, obviously the data is not there. But uh, I looked up the Moderna vaccination, not because I'm targeting Moderna, but I, I was surprised at how many vaccines companies there are. And that was one of the, the names that I recognized. So I was like, oh, well, let's look at what Moderna is up to. Yep. Um, and there's 125,000 reports of adverse reactions from the Moderna vaccine, which I was like, oh my God. And some of these are, are pretty minor, like fatigue, which I think is common for people getting the vaccine, but some of them are cardiac arrest. Ah, <laughs> uh, crap. That's just canceled that vaccine. So I don't think I want any of them now. <laughs> yeah. That's like, and 1700 of those is death. The adverse Whoa. reaction was death. So if I were looking at getting the vaccine, that's the kind of data that I would want to, I mean, not to say that the other stuff is not important, 
but that's the kind of stuff that I would be looking at. Yeah, I think that it's interesting you say that because I'd want to make an informed decision as well, but it's mm-hmm. getting your hands on that information. Um, yeah. We've had the line pedal that um, from the government, from the federal government. Our state governments are great. Thank God we've got state governments is all I can say. But our federal government is like, well, there'll be a few deaths, but we can accept that. It's like, yeah, that's fine for you guys. But to me, that's like putting a gun to my head and spinning the barrel and just hoping it's not in the chain when I pull it, right? right. But it's interesting. We had two things. We had the CEO of Virgin Airlines here, uh, maybe Virgin International. She said, well, we should open up. We should expect a few deaths. And she got lambasted for it. We're like, seriously? You just want us to die so you can make your money and open your airline up? And then the government's saying, well, we can roll it out and we're going to expect there'll be a few deaths from the vaccine. You're like, uh, you just said the same thing. Yeah. You know, you've lambasted the CEO for saying exactly what you said for yeah. different reasons. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. It's a whole mess. Let's put it this way. It's a whole mess that I don't think it's going to be over anytime soon. Well, I think that's why, too, you can't have blanket things like mandatory vaccinations, which here is against uh, the Constitution. But because I think everybody has to make this decision for themselves, because if you might have some crazy heart condition, let's say, since we were just talking about cardiac uh, arrest event, that puts you at risk. So you should be able to opt out for that reason or for whatever reason, you know, I don't know, you might have allergies or autoimmune. I have a lot of clients with autoimmune stuff. So I'm like hyper aware of autoimmune. Like I don't have, um, well, I don't anyways, but I wouldn't have chemicals in my office or, uh, you know, anything, any kind of chemical cleaners or artificial scents and stuff because people have reactions. So I, I think you got to think about that. How does it affect you running a business or doing what you do? Because if you had someone come in to wherever you do your place of work and they've had the problem, then we do what's called deep cleans. And I know that means a lot of synthetic materials and stuff hitting the walls. And so how do you handle that? Well, that's one of the reasons why I was freaking out when I found out the, of the mask thing. I'm like, <gasps> what am I going to do? Um, because I can't deep clean my office. I have, I don't have like stainless steel and glass and stuff that you can just easily wipe down. I have fabric, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah. and I call a company <laughs> to do that, you know, so I was struggling to kind of figure out, well, how am I going to let people in? Am I going to, you know, and then, so, um, just fortunately I've had a, uh, checkup scheduled. So I went in to see the doctor. They're still masked. Everybody's still masked. They're still following the same protocol. And I have a client who's a doctor and I talked to him about it. He said the same thing. So I think that's the only thing I can do because within the last 60 or 30 days of um, right before this happened, I was exposed to COVID twice indirectly. So I was exposed to somebody who had it and I was exposed to somebody who was exposed to somebody who had it. So it was like self-quarantine, either get tested or wait until they get tested. And I don't want to be the one that's passing it around. No. So it, this whole trust thing, I'll just trust that you, you have a vaccine or just trust that you're going to wear a mask if you need to. It's kind of like, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you say that because, <clears throat> and I've got a cough, but this is a normal cold, everyone. <laughs> the, um, we have certain <sighs> suburbs and areas where we know this thing's going to be a problem. And it's always a cultural issue of, some people are more together culturally than say yes. we might be. And so the transmission's quicker. Uh, there's some areas where they really don't take the laws that seriously. And like, so when it appears in the news, we're going, yep, yeah, I could have taken, can we do bets on this? Yep, yeah, that one. I already knew that was going to happen. <laughs> but what, what's very interesting to Australians is that how far people actually travel in a day and where, how many places they go. Because mm. as in my world, I live on a computer. I work on a computer when I'm not working on it. I'm designing the garden. I'm cartooning. I'm doing whatever. I rarely go anywhere. To be honest with you, I see the sunset on the computer screen, which explains why I get low vitamin D in a country full of sun. But you look and you say, oh, this person contracted and you're watching. You're going, so they went from Preston somewhere up north and then they went down to Springvale and then they went out to, what hell, how did they do that in one day? Like, what are you, (laughs) speeding all the way? And you look and go, people travel a lot. And because we have, like, we know of a few, 
we have more rats who go from one mall to another and they just do that to hang out. And of course, malls are full of people and there's other mall rats who go and go other malls and we're like, seriously? You know, so I think it's a bit of shock. There's been a lot of comments online like, wow, like these people go to these places in a day. They're like, wow. So then you start seeing how this thing can spread fast, right? It's kind because of, you don't understand up to that point. Oh, I couldn't understand. I'm like, well, how is it spreading so fast? Is it just jumping across the neighbor's fence? But it's not. <laughs> These people, it, maybe they have lives. I don't. <laughs> maybe that's it. <laughs> well, but I think that's where personal responsibility comes in too, because in, in PAN, you know, we have sovereignty and then connection. So sovereignty, I can do whatever I want, but with connection is I need to look out for you too. And I think there are people that it's kind of a one or the other thing. I'm going to do my thing and not care about you. Because when you see things like these huge weddings or all mm-hmm. these people at the beach, or I'm just like, oh, I don't know about that, you guys. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, I guess, but I'm not going to be out there. That's right. I think I saw the drama of Cynthia Bailey's, Bailey's wedding on Real Housewives of Atlanta. And then she wanted a big wedding. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'd be wanting a big wedding. No. You know, it's the nice fantasy, but reality is that's not a good idea. We do have, it's interesting that the government itself here, the federal government, well, all governments here, um, are pushing, you know, uh, to look out for one another. And we're having a lot of mindfulness training and stuff in the organizations. Like a lot of organizations sound really good here. I'm quite impressed considering what I think of organizations in general. But um, I, I don't understand the message from the government. I was discussing with a friend who's in Austria and I said, listen, our government's saying, well, it's for the good of the community. I said, but up until now, they've been teaching us it's everybody for themselves, right? Um, you're competing with your neighbor to hell with everyone. And now you want them to care. I said, we need to change the way we run our society and what our goals are. Because yeah. sure. we got people fighting over toilet rolls right now, again, right? Really? <laughs> I don't know if you had that in the States, but here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, I I, was try, I remember that um, melancholy or melancholy. I'm not sure how you guys say it. Melancholy, the film, uh-huh. where they got a planet hurtling towards Earth, and it's a miserable movie. I've got to give it away to someone, but no one wants it. But I thought, well, so if a planet was hurtling towards Earth, we would have billions of people raiding supermarkets for toilet roll. Like, does it matter? <laughs> At that point. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 I do think we need to shift our perspective. And part of that actually is with the focus on vaccines, that's, that's a germ theory kind of thing. Well, if I get exposed to germs, I'm going to get sick, but people don't realize, maybe, maybe they don't realize I'm taking for granted. They don't realize that um, how many germs we just are all around us all the time. I took a class on, on healing the gut. And one of the most fascinating things that came out of that is the instructor was saying that your mouth all the way down to your anus is a hollow tube that's populated with more germs than you have cells in your whole body. So basically we're all um, colonized by aliens. <laughs> <laughs> that's... Little aliens and they're like parasitic aliens <laughs> inside of us. And you think about that, that's so gross. But most of us are healthy. <laughs> this is it. Parasitic aliens, though. It's funny you say that. I watched a doco on TV, documentary. I always call it doco. Um, so I grew up understanding or believing that the body was mostly water, 75% water, and a couple of bucks worth of chemicals, okay? And then I find out watching this doco that, well, actually, most of your body is bacteria. I'm like, oh, Really? So yeah. now, so it's taken my, my concept of the body from a community of cells because everything works together, which is amazing. When you look at the design of the body, how it's evolved or how it's created, depending on how you look at it, and you look at everything works in harmony together generally, okay? Now you realize you're a community of bacteria yeah. and germs and that yeah. that is you, right? So when people go, oh, well, I'm going to wash my hands. Yeah, wash your hands, but you're the problem because <laughs> you are the bacteria. <laughs> and yeah as you say i said when it first came out you know the oldest fossils we found of us in west africa i think it was was three hundred thousand years old in a current form or close to what we are today i said so you're telling us the immune system can't handle this because generally we've handled three hundred thousand years right right so uh, that's where i sit there thinking and when you look at the um 
the stats on the deaths from COVID, a lot of it has other complications. There's a very small percentage right. actually COVID. So yes, you know, we have bacteria. I'm sure that bacteria also fights with other bacteria. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, the, this fear of germs, which I thought, I believe comes from the 1800s or, what was it, 1800s or 1600s, 1866. Did England have the plague? I should know this. I know it was a year before the fire of London, but I remember we were generally, from what I learned of history, and I'm not a history fan, so anyone could go Google and correct me on this, but is that we were generally kind of uh, unhygienic up to the point we realized we need to clean our act up. But now it seems we've gone so far that small things are affecting us because we put ourselves yeah. in this bubble. Yeah. 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 And that's why I think it's smart to, to look at the terrain versus not, not to say it's either or germ theory or terrain, but I mean, most people who get COVID, the vast majority, I think it's like 90 something percent survive. And, yeah. and most people who get it don't even know they have it. So that means your immune system is working. And, you know, if you take grass seeds and throw them in the desert, they're not going to grow. So if you don't have the terrain where these things can grow, even cancer cells, somebody told me this, uh, that, that the average human gets cancer 11 times in their life, but your immune system takes care of it. To me, that's shocking. Wow. Shocking. 11 times in your life, your cells go crazy and they start multiplying and then your body just takes care of it. That's amazing. That to me says you need to be paying more attention to the terrain. So get outside, get some sun, get some exercise, breathe, eat good food, you know? Um, yeah. They said that the people with lung complications, which is a lot of them with COVID, the vast majority of them have low vitamin D. That's an easy fix, a super easy fix. So <laughs> get out in the sun. Be, yeah, yeah, looking at the terrain. I had... I must have had low vitamin D how many years ago now? Was it before I went to Mexico? It was down at number 25. It's supposed to be 75. It was low. And then he's like, well, you work on a computer, you're in the office all day. And in Australia, pretty much most of the year, we're wearing sunblock because the sun mm -hmm. here just frazzles you like. <clears throat> so I lifted that up with vitamin D2 tablets. <laughs> Took the easy route because, you know, I'm sitting on the computer. Yeah, I just have a tablet. But now, now I'm working from home. The wife makes me sit outside to get my vitamin D. Yeah. But it's interesting you say that because diet. My my father, I got two lots of parents. One lot here, one in England. Due to divorce when I was one. Uh, my father in England is talking about that right now. He's read some book on COVID, um, and he's talking about health, exercise, diet. You know, yeah. good food because what you put in is going to come out. Right, it's going to affect sure. you. And I totally agree with that. If you look at what we sell people as food, as a diet, right? And I'm not going to get into my vegan crap and stuff and annoy people about that. Just in general, if you're not vegan or whatever, look at what you're eating because what they're selling is making a profit. It's not necessarily good for you. That's right. right? That's right. Fruit yeah, loops. because what we eat feeds our bacteria. And if you mm. don't have the terrain where you can have good, healthy bacteria, you're going to have the bad ones. <laughs> That's right. You're going to be the dark side of the force. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. other interesting thing about this is the process of living itself. As I say to people, I, I find it interesting. I don't, I don't know why I don't understand it. Maybe I'm supposed to. There's a lot of effort into longevity. And I'm like, but we didn't evolve to last. There's a reason for that. Okay. Yeah. I said, we have a few leaders in the world we're having issues with right now, but thank God they didn't evolve to last because at some point that stops. <laughs> so it's accepting the process that life is you start here, there's a beginning and there will be an end. And accepting that is that, that makes things so much easier. Like, well, yeah, I don't, I don't get to choose probably what the end will be or when it will be. But uh, fear of death, knowing that, Ultimately, that's coming regardless, right? So everybody rushing out for a vaccine now. I hate to be rude, but, you know, sometime in the future, it's going to happen. <laughs> well, there's the implication too. So if as animists, we um, live in a relationship with everything, including bacteria and viruses, and, you know, everything is sacred, so are bacteria and viruses, then, I mean, not to kind of go down a rabbit hole with this, but then, you know, if you're thinking... So like for you, you're a vegan. Yeah. If you're not going to eat animal products, are you going to kill bacteria and viruses with a vaccine? 
And that's hard, right? Because that's why I chose I chose the vaccine that you now put the block on <laughs> by looking it up online. But I looked at my donor now and I went down to the empty wheel and went synthetic, okay? No animal products that I can find yet and train my body rather than kill a half debilitated bacteria. And that, that becomes hard because from a vegan animist point of view, because um, I'm animist first, then veganism is how I practice it with mm-hmm. the extension into other sentient communities like trees and so on. Uh, you sit there and you think, well, you look at the world in general and there seems to be invasions here. They, I, I don't understand why I've got a world where there's other things killing other things to eat them. That confuses me, but it's reality. So it's just my problem coming to terms with reality. But in terms of uh, viruses, it's like, okay, so I'm getting an invasion. Is this like warfare for me internally? Do I need to train my body to fight it off? And what's the benefit to this, right? So the benefit would, to me is I always envisioned that we would go out into the universe and take other sentient beings and life forms and that with us, right? Not just humans go to Mars and we live there. How boring is that? Let's go to Mars, let's put trees in, let's bring foxes over, let's bring everything over and say, if you want life in the universe, in a billion years' time, you're going to have a lot of life out there if you put it out there and it's going to evolve, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. So there's benefit to training our bodies to fight off an invasion that has dubious sources to begin with, like did it come from a pangolin? Did it come from a bat? Did it come from some the laboratory in um, China now? We're looking at that and I think, well, is that propaganda because we've got a few powerful countries now got problems with each other, so I don't want to believe that either. So, yeah, it's hard. Bacteria, viruses. I ch- My life in general is a more fundamentalist vegan lifestyle. So it's, it's painful in that I, I literally have learned to walk. And if I hear a slight crunch under my foot, I know it's a snail shell, my foot moves. Or I see a snail, my foot will divert 45 degrees to the right. Or, and, and so stepping on any sentient being becomes a massive guilt trip. <laughs> and uh, a whacking over the head like how can you be so stupid you didn't see that you lost your mindfulness for a minute how, how do we fight a viruses you know um for vegan animals point of view this part of life right this is a process it is. and it's a case of is this a grand determinism thing where this was going to happen regardless for us because there is a plan or is it more free will and this just happened a circumstance i don't know yeah. i don't know how to answer it this all I say from my point of view is you do your best right. as, as you can, right? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So but I think you have to think about the ingredients because, and I don't, I didn't verify this or not, but I heard about the Islam uh, question about pig proteins in, inside the vaccines and um, fetal stem cells. So I did see that one was confirmed by a F- FDA website, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, FDA, CDC, one of the, you know, the officials and the African green monkey kidney pus cells. So those are animal products for sure. Uh, and I don't know, is, is there a difference, you know, <laughs> eating them versus injecting them? I mean, I think there's a lot of moral questions. There is. For some people, the, other people are not going to be bothered. <laughs> yeah, people don't care. Right? They're just like, give me the vaccine now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess it depends which stance I'll take. If I ever took the more vegan animist stance, I'd be like, well, how much suffering was involved or did you take it from some of the things you grew in a lab? But from the animist point of view, those cells are probably conscious as well, right? That's so right. there's consciousness yeah. and everything. So right. are we exploiting? Um, it's like... If I eat food, I look at it more as often the opportunity to become part of my community. Right? It's my body, it's my community. You can now become a part of this. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Right? <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> that's it. And it's probably to say, well, I didn't hear the carrot scream. <laughs> so, you know, you're squeamish about it. But that's the way I look at it. But when you look at the pig genes and that, I know there's exploitation. I know there's suffering behind it. Generally, I can, yeah. And so then it's like, well, I don't want to be a part of this. So do I not become a part of this and say, well, I, and to me, the ethics um, are more important than other considerations. So um, we've had discussions at work once. 
once everybody so being an animist i don't bring up at work because it's hard enough for them to accept veganism <laughs> to go any further and say well you know i didn't delete that word because it's now an idea and blah blah, blah. They, they'd be like you're, you're completely crazy I'd be like well i thought we already agreed on that when i said i was vegan but anyway um yeah in terms of veganism uh they bring up some moral dilemmas i'm like you gotta understand that it in terms of trying to contrast money there's no price you cannot offer me enough money to kill an animal or ingest an animal it's just not going to happen and so when it comes to life and death decisions and they always offer these ones up oh but if a tiger was coming to kill you i'm like well now it's the law of the jungle <clears throat> i'm sure i kick into action and we're going to have a fight and i'll probably get killed but i'm going to try and survive that one <clears throat> but if i have a choice um the vaccine and be like yeah and it's funny you brought that up because i brought it up with the wife last night my wife i said um hey if astrazeneca is like from animal proteins i can't take it because i'm vegan so you're gonna have to offer me moderna which i'm hoping i'm gonna have a look at right but now i've heard moderna is a bit of an issue anyway but it's got to be something that's vegan i've got to stick by that principle of nowhere along the chain did anything suffer i cannot stop the fact that the truck delivering it run over a bunch of snails and ants and cane toads or hit a wallaby for Christ's sake because they travel at night. Um, I can't, there's a lot of things I can't stop, but I would do my best. Um, so it's the exploitation side. If it was, if there was no exploitation, uh, if it was just lab built and we knew that from a vegan point of view it was acceptable, I could say, okay, that doesn't condone lab meat. I can't do that, right? So <laughs> I just can't do that. But vaccines, yeah, I could handle it better. But then it's a case of, you know, your next consideration is, well, will I die from the vaccine first? Would I have been better off contracting the virus right. and having those cells in my bone marrow ready for the next lot, right? So Yeah, it's a lot to wrap your head around. It is. I probably I mean, overthink it. Thoughtful, <laughs> you know? But the common, what I call the common proletariat, the, the people who are conditioned to this modernist world or Post, well, it's postmodern now, but the Industrial Revolution brought these people to be mindless zombies to train us to be obedient and just do our job and do as we're told. I don't know how you explain to them and say, hey, you've got a choice here. Yeah. And you can, you can critically think about the information if you can trust the information. Uh, what you get in is a lot of um, people being told, well, this is reality, right? You've got a body. Let's not discuss bacteria in it, right? It's not that. We've only just begun discussing the gut for the last 10 years here. Uh, this is the food you're going to eat. We're going to call it a diet, but it's hamburgers and stuff. You'll be happy with that. Wash it down with some kind of cola. And uh, when you get sick, vaccinate. Uh, it's like, well, when you're obese, well, it's not a dietary problem. It's something we can sell you to fix it. <laughs> we've, we've lost the fundamentals. Yeah. In dealing with this, we're basically abusing the body yes. and made the mind that is evolved. I mean, very clever system, right? Everything you look at is a miracle. If people stopped and just went, wow, really? Like plants come in these shapes and colors. People come in these shapes and colors. Uh, there's this variety of animals. Like you'd stop and go, wow, what the hell are we doing? But they yeah. don't. Okay. They just walk along mindlessly, sleepwalking and accepting everything that's thrown at them and yeah, I don't know what to do because then you stand out as a bit of an outlier because you're looking at the information and you can argue till the cows come home because they come home in my world because I ain't eating them, right? So <laughs> you can argue till the cows come home and these people just go, yeah, blah, 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 and you're like, yeah, whatever you Googled, mate. It's, you, you're overwhelmed. I think we need for something such as this and for animism to continue. And we've had some great, I mean, New Zealand has had some great laws put in place for animism and starting to move to this view in the world. Australia's done a few as well now. Uh, okay, it puts them in the case of personhood, but that's the best we can do with the law we have at the moment. Uh, we've got to start moving to that view to handle these things in a better manner going forward. At the moment, it's... Yeah. I don't know if people know where to look. So there's the, the research. But uh, I used to um, sell natural bath and body products because I couldn't find anything that, that met my bar for what I wanted to put on my body. Your skin's porous. If there's something on it, it's in your body. Um, so I made my own. 
and I started selling it to people. And there are lots of regulations here about how you do that. And you have to have a material safety data sheet and everything that you use has to have a material safety data sheet that says that it's safe to use. So if, and that's like public, anybody can go and see this stuff because you might be, you know, you might have an accident, you might need to know. Um, and not to pick on Moderna again, but it, yeah. you know, when it was in my, <laughs> my head. Um, so they have a, a ingredient called SM102. So I look up SM102 in the material safety data sheet. And it says it's not for human or veterinary use. Oh, no. <laughs> Did <Yeah>. not say <laughs> that. <laughs> One, <Yeah>. oh, two. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I mean, it's stuff like that that they don't tell you. You know, you just go in and they just say, okay, I'm going to just give you this thing. And they, you might get a pamphlet, like if you do with uh, prescriptions and stuff. But it, and it's got, oh, it may cause death. <laughs> the side effects may include yeah. death. <laughs> people take it anyway <laughs> this is an interesting thing uh i i met it we were out at a cafe in a place called yaragon which is just a bit further away from where we are in drew in victoria and uh we sat next to a table with this guy who was talking about this right um now okay he's a pro-conspiracy theorist but that doesn't mean all conspiracies are rubbish you know mm -hmm. Sure. And it just means he's probably more aware of what's going on than anyone else because he seemed to have a lot of screenshots of stuff he was showing me on his mobile mm -hmm. or his cell phone. Um, and he, uh, he had screenshot something from the West Australian government, state government website, and it, it literally used the word poison for the name vaccine, that this poison will be distributed. I'm like, wow, Really? And I had a look, like I looked at that screenshot to see if he's talking about pesticides or whatever. And no, it was talking about the vaccine. It called it a poison. And I'm like, yeah, it's not a good thing because you're saying you're poisoning us. Okay. Like the stuff you put in our tap water pretty much was made right. for pesticide. But now we drink it in safe doses in quotes. Um, yeah. And it's kind of interesting, not for human or animal consumption. Yeah. But yeah. And sometimes they'll, they'll um, say, well, in this quantity, it's safe, uh, which may or may not be true because, you know, belladonna is toxic, but we do use it medicinally and digitalis yeah. is the same. So it, I, I'm not saying that, you know, that the vaccine is toxic. I'm just saying my eyes bugged out when I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's a very interesting thing. And you got to, I think one of the themes for the whole problem whole pandemic has been faith in the system can yeah. we trust it right yeah absolutely i mean we've gone hard line on uh experts are saying the old experts right? it's still an opinion regardless but experts are saying and the scientific data and the statistics i'm like we're going hard line on this thing that to me disconnected us from the world in the first place by objectifying everything okay mm -hmm. so now it's scientific data stats um, you know, the experts agree. So you must do this, right? Because it's backed by this rubbish over here, which I'm like, it's like when you get a survey and they say, well, 90% of people want to take the vaccine. I'm like, yeah, well, what questions did you ask? You're not telling me the questions. Right. right? Yeah. The question could have been, would you take the vaccine if I give you a million bucks? Yes, right. we would. Okay. So 90% of people, <clears throat> it's how they present it is always the top end of the iceberg. And we don't see the rest of the information. And that's where we're not making informed decisions. Right. There's this great, great uh, place in New York. Um, what is it? It's like a cooperative of some kind or non, it's a nonprofit called the Right Question Institute. And mm -hmm. I've been receiving emails from them because I've got into questions at some point in my life after being taught not to ask. Well, that's not true. I always ask questions and got into trouble. But the Right Question Institute is talking about microdemocracy and teaching kids to question again and these sorts of things. And I thought that's an interesting concept because if you look at most people, they are conditioned not to question. And in right. times like this, you need to be asking questions. Yeah. No. Yeah. You would you would take this because it's and it's safe. Yeah. Really? Why is that? You know. And you start giving me the information. Ask questions. Well, here, um, the FDA, the CDC, and what's the other big one? Um, it's the people that are all in charge of vaccines and policy. Yeah, They're all in this together. 
So there's no checks and balances. And every, I mean, they profit from their own data. Yes. So if you're not doing your own research, and again, I'm not saying anybody's doing anything bad. I'm not, you know, yeah. everybody's gonna make up their own decision at how they want to interpret the facts. But I think if you're not questioning, when you see that kind of thing going on, that's just crazy. Because I know when I was a little kid, a hospital was about the size of a hotel. Big, mm. but not like crazy big. Now that's like one wing. That's the heart wing. <laughs> that's the yeah. lung wing. You know, that's the cancer <laughs> wing. Medicine is a big, giant business. So when somebody's trying to give you drugs, vaccines, heart medicine, whatever, <laughs> You know, to me, that's like I'm just keeping my staying, keeping myself in business. So yeah. I'll take care of my own health. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is true, actually. Um, money corrupts big time. Yeah. Mm. And the, when the first vaccines were coming out or being advertised on our TV, I'm like, big pharma, not interested. <laughs> because, you know, people, uh, they did a study here on politicians government departments and how often they would bend the rules for things such as money and that how easy they can be basically corrupted and i think people well i don't think people were shocked about politicians but it was a shock at how easily many of the people who are leading in these positions will make a decision based upon their own benefit or the benefit of something that they're interested in which is not for the good of the community Right. right, and generally it boils down to money. This this evil I call money. Because I'm an anarchist as well, so it's yeah. It, it makes it difficult because as soon as I hear something, I'm like, where that information come from? What are you selling me? Our news, particularly, is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Like it pretty much is just one lot of news. We're we're fighting to get more diversity in our news in the government right now. So when I hear something, every news story I see is selling something. If I'm interviewing somebody at the end of the interview is, oh, and you, they've written a book. I'm like, oh, seriously? So we weren't really interested in them. We're just selling something, right? And it's the same with this kind of news. Oh, this, this vaccine's out and blah, blah, blah. And I said to my wife, well, that's new technology. mRNA is new technology. Would you go and buy the first model of car because you know it's going to come with teething problems? I said, so I'd rather go with old technology. But then the old technology started having its problems. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I'm not interested in any, any technology. I was interested in one until you brought it up, uh, SM102. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 but, yeah, it's such a difficult time. There's too many vested interests. And Australia's done well because our state governments have been more interested in the health of the people rather than the economic interests. Um, our federal government, I think, is coming around to more the health of the people because I felt like they're really about economic interests. And someone said to me, which is very interesting, um, they said, hey, all the, ah, okay. Yeah, I got a guy at work who we have philosophical discussions with. He's a great guy. I uh, love him to death, Alex. He's uh, from Sri Lanka originally. And um, and he's got a PhD in engineering. We've got some smart guys. They're smarter than me. So it's always fun to ask them opinions on stuff. And he said, hey, it's like the developed nations think this won't touch them. I'm like, that's interesting you say that because sitting in a so-called developed nation, although we also call it a banana republic, um, I can see that a lot of the leaders here seem to think that they can just open up for their own economic interests and somehow this ain't going to affect them. And, you know, we're looking at what's going on in India and we did shut the borders. Well, the federal government shut the borders. They control the air, airways or airlines. They shut the borders to Australians coming home who are Indian descent or the Australian citizens who were Indian once. And we had a massive uproar and I have two lots of friends online on Facebook. I, I, I never get involved in these things. Uh, one friend is like, well, he's Indian background. And he says, well, you know, you guys aren't standing doors and wearing masks. The thing's spreading fast and 120 police officers died this week of COVID because you guys want to obey the rules. My other lot of friends are sitting there saying, oh, this is racist, this is that, and we should go to the Indian community leaders, start complaining about, oh, man, look at the division this is causing. But look at the problem between a developed nation and developing na nations. And what my friend Alex said at work was, this is a global issue and developing or developed nations need to understand this. This isn't just about it's us versus them. This is a global problem. If we don't fix it globally, 
or sort it out globally is because it's to keep coming back and biting us. It doesn't matter where we think we stand in this social hierarchy in the world. So for yeah, it's kind of really interesting. And we know that most developed nations, there's a few strong Asian nations, and there's a lot of nations from Western, Western or Europe, basically. So yeah. run by white people, but we're trying to change that way. So there's like, let's just say it. There's a lot of white Western people running things, and they seem to be living in the past, running these companies. Well, that's what I see on TV anyway. <laughs> and yeah, the attitude seems to be, well, you guys open up because somehow there's this belief it won't affect us. And I don't think a virus gives a damn. I don't right. care who you are. Yeah. It's only it's only caring more about people in impoverished areas because you're not doing your job down there and helping them out. I mean, I was watching the uh, CNA Channel News Asia. So it's a news channel we watch a lot here because basically we're in Asia. They had uh, the Philippines um, sometime a few months ago. They're going around testing more of the impoverished barrios in the Philippines. And it is typical, it's kind of cute because it's typical Filipino in some ways. You see, they're just, the kids are laughing and smiling. The kid, the thing, the gun pointed at their head to check the temperature and this and that. And they said something interesting. They said, yeah, well, why are they worrying about COVID coming through our suburbs and killing us? He says, we're worried about how we're going to eat the next day. Right. He says, so we've got yeah. bigger problems to worry about. Yeah. Okay. And you're like, yeah, this is, this is, this is really brought to the fore the stratification of society that we are all connected and that we need to be fixing this. We need to change the whole paradigm of how we think the community in each country should run, what we think the goal of each country is. Because the well, reason we're not... Yeah. One of the issues when you were talking about the Filipino story um, that Western people overlook because it didn't happen to them is you have a history of genocide by smallpox, which yep. impacts the psyche, <coughs> the, the, you know, what the DNA remembers, the, what do you call that, um, epigenetics. And then you have the Tuskegee experiment. I don't know if you know about that down there, no. where um, uh, dark people were given syphilis and not treated so that they could study the, the progress of the disease. And so when you look at these corporations and, you, and they're like, hey, we have the solution and you're wondering why people are, are not lining up to take it, it's because we have a history of, of deceit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. That's something we can't forget too. I mean, we have an opportunity to do better. I hope that we do do better because this stuff is still in, within memory. It's not that long ago that this stuff happened. The issue there is that it's not in everyone's memory because we're not taught that. Yeah. You know? So I remember when we had the Black Lives Matter marches in America, I was watching ABC and I saw some of the comments from people I know in Australia. And I'm going to say younger people, it was younger people. Um, you know, are they affecting businesses? Are this, are that, blah, blah. I thought, seriously, seriously. You don't know the situation over there. You're just rattling off from your perspective. And it's because, you, well, number one, it's because you never grew up with rap music like me, listening to Chuck D and understand what's going on. I, I'm going to say rap music educated a lot of the world in what was happening in America at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And it's still happening to today, right? Mm -hmm. But that education isn't there. We know in Australia, we know about the... Um, uh, uh, what do you call it, massacres of Aboriginals. We know we had a war landing in this country straight away. Um, we know, I don't, there's mixed messages, but we kind of figure that from what I've read, what you can find, we weren't exactly welcomed with open arms either. I mean, you come on someone's land, they're like, who the hell are they? So there's a few, um, you see some accounts where it's like, uh, yeah, we were in trouble too. But then, you know what, as history is conquering, we're better armed than that. It just goes pear shaped from there. And when you look back for it, it's always the leaders of the country who do things in your name that you would not agree with. And that, that really irks me. And like you say, big pharma, politicians. At the moment, we've got this um, sort of digression here, but we've got this problem between we've got the US and China. I think we've got the Russia sitting there waiting to jump on the back of this thing. And I don't know if you guys hear it, but they're all looking at us. We're getting a lot of flack from China. 
Um, mm-hmm. Biden said something to China about leave us alone. I'm like, are we going to be the next Vietnam? I said, because I've just went to my house. <laughs> so, <laughs> I need this happening right now. But again, leaders doing things that the general community would not agree with. And when I go onto the Asian news sites, you see division like on the Singapore news between those who consider themselves Singaporean, those who consider themselves Chinese. And I'm like, I wrote a comment saying, guys, this is not a football match. These guys are trying to get you rallying for each side. People die. You die. It's not you who's winning this. It's not you that actually should be involved in this. It's their problem. They don't get bossing gloves, go sort it out somewhere else. And these leaders do things that are quite atrocious. And then in our name, and then we're not taught about it. I did not know that France used uh, people, like literally used people from, is it? wasn't Sierra Leone, somewhere in Africa. <laughs> there you go. I've already forgotten that. I only saw the dog a once. They used him in, uh, I think it was the Second World War, and then quickly dispatched them all back home to their homeland before having the parades so that the only people you saw in parades were like white French people. And so they sent them back home and said, when you get home, you will keep the wage that we're giving you and all this sort of a thing. They did not do that. Uh, they sent one guy down to a village where they made a happy film of him returning and everybody cheering and how great it was. Whilst that was happening, the people they sent back who were soldiers who fought for France, who pretty much are French citizens, were kept in uh, like a, a lockdown of some kind. They started complaining they weren't getting their wages, they weren't getting food. So what other French government do at the time? Oh, we'll just shoot them all and kill them all. That just come out. I was like, seriously? They kept that hidden for 50 years. So when people say to me, oh, well, you know, if something happened, oh, we'd know about it, so I didn't. It's like, no, man, they hid that for 50 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. So these people who do these, like, atrocious things in our name and then try and manufacture consent among the rest of us, because back then, I mean, they would look down on black people and so on. That doesn't go back many generations. I mean, you're looking at my grandparents' generation, okay? Literally, there were things, there are sayings in our language that give this away. I was talking to a great friend of mine, James Katonga. Okay, he's from Kenya, but he's Australian now, obviously. He's from Kenya. And we're just talking naturally, right? We get along like a house on fire, right? So we're just talking. And then when we're talking about something, there was some argument he was discussing with me about this. Now I said, Well, that's the pot calling the kettle. And I stopped and he, he smiles <laughs> and he goes, He leans forward, he says, Black. I went, Wow, yeah. And he just laughed, <laughs> right? And I'm like, I never realized what that meant to me. And maybe because maybe I'm a bit autistic with the way I look at things. There's a pot, there's a kettle, they sit above the fire, they're both black. But that connection was never made. And then I started remembering other things that have been said in the past. I'm like, wow, there's a saying in England among my grandparents' generation, I was from a dead, I think. And that was, we used to play soccer and they'd yell out, play the white man. I never knew what that meant. I actually did not know what that meant until much later someone said to me, well, because black people can't be trusted. I'm like, whoa, really? I said, thank God I haven't said that because to me it's like, oh, play the... So this is, you can see it in our language and it's not far, not so long ago. And this is what manufactures consent for these atrocious acts because it demeans and devalues other people. Instead of looking at humans as a miracle, I mean, in, in the variety of humanity we have, in a, a universe, this life sprang from nothing. It appeared, okay? That's the way I look at it. And then you say, look at the variety. There's, there's beauty in that. But instead of seeing that, we've got these idiots going around saying, well, they're worth less because uh, they, they evolved to survive hotter sun than us. Seriously? <laughs> that, that, that sounds crazy. When you look at it, it's crazy. This person can't do the job because they're a different color. <laughs> what the hell is that? I mean, okay. So I get a mobile phone and they might color code it. This red one does this, the blue one does that. But this isn't humans. It's crazy. So yeah, I can understand why people wouldn't want the vaccine given the history. But the problem with the history is we're not taught the history. And in Spike Lee, um, Do the Right Thing, I don't know if you've seen the movie. I love his movies. Um, when I think it, uh, one of the guys in the movie, African-American guy, says to Sal, hey, man, why you got no brothers on the wall? Why are they all Italians? And like, you sell to us, but you're not putting the people 
who are famous in our community. You're not putting up people of note on your wall. They're all Italians, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. It's there. It's still there. And that's why, yeah, I can understand that lack of faith. I really can. But we're not taught. We're not taught that. Sal didn't know that in his pizzeria. We don't know that. Um, it's something that I feel maybe is, in some ways, it's embarrassing, okay, to say, hey, this is what happened in the past in our name. This is what our ancestors did. In another way, it's, shit, if we bring it up, does this become a legal issue and cost us money? I'm sure that's a part of it too. I'm sure that's a part yeah, of it. it. It's not been that long. It was only in the 70s that the uh, there was mass uh, sterilization of Native American women. So wow. all I'm trying to say by that is, is that we, we do have a history, and I think everybody owes it to themselves to be sovereign, to do your mm. own history own research and decide for you based on your history your your health your lifestyle you know do you want a vaccine or not and and if that meets your bar and that's what you want good on you yeah but just make an informed choice that's that's all i'm saying and think about the the welfare of the community too because that's part of it sovereignty and connection they go hand in hand it's not just like you were saying i'm just going to do this because it's it's for my benefit so what mm. about our benefit? And just one more last thing before we run out of time. Yeah. <laughs> There's other things in the vaccines like formaldehyde. And when we're buried, if this is on our body, it goes into the soil. Mm. And well, then so it, it, it's everywhere. So I, I think we need to, to, to think about all the things we put in our body, not just the food and the toxic food that we eat, because it's all going to come out somewhere. It goes somewhere. That's true. That's how it goes for that cycle for the, the process of life, right? We're going to get yeah. back in the ground. It's interesting yeah. you say that. I never made that connection, except in smokers, where I said if we all died out tomorrow, maybe a billion years from now, other people will land on a planet and say, hey, they were made from plant life because we had smokers and tobacco and various <laughs> other right. things. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it's true. The sovereignty and community is an important thing. Um, and it's what we need to start training people to understand or teach them, educate them, because at the moment we're still wallowing in ignorance about a lot of things and we're accepting uh, authorities that perhaps are not doing the right thing by any of us. Right, yeah. Mm. Well, thanks, Dwayne. It flew by. It was so interesting talking to you. I appreciate you being here. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> this is a great talk. Yeah. So I'd like to close by sending gratitude to Dwayne, to all of our listeners, to Elements and our loving, helping ancestors. And if you found this helpful, please consider donating to Pan Society as we do need your financial and emotional support. So thank you all for tuning in. I'm Laura Giles for Modern Animism Radio, and I'll see you next week. 